Welcome back, everybody, to Pull Hook Golf, the podcast. I'm your host, Matt Cook. Tonight, we have an awesome episode for all of you. We've got Butsy joining us here remotely from a hotel room, and who knows what he's been doing in there, but, uh, man, he's looking fresh to death. The cheeks are red already, and I am absolutely pumped for this episode because, folks, I'm going to go over a little bit of what we're going to go over tonight. We're going to go over the tee off report. That is our new segment with Botsy to where we just tee off on some topics around that. Then from there, we've got the pro golf recap segment, which we're going to be going over the Shriners open. That was an awesome golf tournament. I love that track over at TPC Summerlin and let's keep it moving with the Swanee style segment. And then we've got the big preview of the episode, which is the upcoming Zozo Championship. And then we got some live golf updates, too. What was that, Putsy? Nothing. Go ahead. (laughs) But without further ado, we do want to uh, mention our sponsors, which I am wearing tonight, the Swanee's Gear, folks. If you haven't noticed, last week they launched a brand new line, an absolute brand new line. It is called Black Swan. It is a higher-end line. A little bit more pricey, but man, the clothing is awesome. But if you just want a great hoodie that is golf appropriate, work appropriate, whatever appropriate, this Camden hoodie. I've had this one from the beginning of working with Swannies. And man, this this Camden hoodie, it is comfy. It is nice. It's great on the golf course as well. So without... Uh, Further ado here, utilize the promo code from Pull Hook Golf. It is Pull Hook Golf 25. If you use that at checkout, all one word, Pull Hook Golf 25 at checkout, you'll get 25% off your entire order. That does include the Black Swan collection, which I'm going to be receiving any day now, and I am absolutely juiced about it. Uh, might give you guys a little bit of insight as to the Swanee style segment as to what we're going to be talking about there. But our very first segment of the night, it is the tee off report with Butsy. Welcome on, Butsy. How are you doing, man? Tired. I'm fucking <laughs> tired. Hang I've been on. in a plane, got there, waited around, uh, felt the rumblings. So I got this thing, and I won't take up too much time here, but... I've never shit on an airplane for obvious reasons. It would be <laughs> terrible for me. And so I felt the hankling of a turd coming on about 30 minutes into the flight. Oh, so no. I fucking freaked out, and I ate a whole roll of Rolaids in an effort to... <laughs> Does that work? Oh, yeah, but But the problem is you're going to be paying for that because that's going to work for about three days. So <laughs> shit or full. Uh, yeah, so that's how I'm doing. I'm a little tired, but dude, just for normal, happy to be here, man. Light tires, light fires, come around, turn four. Bam, let's get it going. Now, with our tee off report, we're going to start off with the good old word association. And first thing that pops in your head after I say the following here we go Zozo Championship. Like a bozo, like a clown. (laughs) Hideki Matsuyama. Sounds like a guy that's going to try to get me to catch a shrimp in my mouth at a cooking table. <laughs> Chopsticks. Uh, Hideki Matsuyama. <laughs> Hibachi. Also, Hideki Matsuyama. <laughs> Xander Shoffley, whose mother is Asian and grew up in Japan. Cigar humidor. Oh. Colin Morikawa, half Japanese. That kid, Data. From the Goonies. <laughs> that's that's pretty. Like that's pretty good. Japanese golf. Hideki Matsuyama. <laughs> we've got we've got a trend here already with Hideki Matsuyama. Now let's get into the second part of the tee off report, which is Batsy on a soapbox. Here we go. Now you've been spending a lot of time at the driving range lately, and I've heard you gripe about a few things, but. I need to know, what have you been seeing out there at the driving range lately? Uh, gosh. I feel like there's this, uh, and I think all dudes know this, and maybe chicks too. I mean, I don't know. I'm not a chick. But the the unsaid competition that's happening between range goers out there, I think, is a real thing. Like, you kind of step back, you sip your soda or your beer, 
and you just hear somebody absolutely throttling on the golf ball. And you kind of look down, but you don't want to really look. You want to look out of the corner of your eye because you don't want to give them too much credibility. And then you kind of notice, hey, it's kind of like sizing somebody up at the gym in, in a way. It's mm. kind of like, you know what I mean? It's like, it's just this so, it's so stupid. But so you make the comparison and you're obviously going to think you're better than them. So if they're hitting driver, you're definitely going to driver. And you're kind of doing this on off me go, you go type thing. And like, who's longer and who's got a bigger shalong banger. <laughs> I think that's going on out there. That's going on. A little competitiveness out there on the range. Especially amongst, like, you might get lucky if you walk onto a busy driving range at night and get more than one guy out there that's got a nice move that's hitting the ball well that probably breaks 80. If you get two or three of those on uh, the same night, fuck, game on, dude. Wow. Like, game on. That's Maybe I'm just out in left field here. Maybe that's just me being a, uh, an idiot. But I, I don't think I'm alone in this. <laughs> that's uh, that's an interesting one. I haven't been out to the driving range in a while, so I'm not quite sure. But I do recall when I would go out and practice, if somebody did crack a driver, you kind of tend to get up there and really crack one, you know, just to let them know, hey, I'm here too, and uh, I, I can hit yeah. it farther than you. Yeah, I got a big old <laughs> set of fucking elk horns on me here. Okay. <laughs> get into the rut. Mark a tree. Oh, I absolutely love that. Now, let's uh, let's see what the audience has to say about that segment. They loved it. Big fans, big fans of the Butsy on a soapbox segment right there, and uh, that that is the T off report, folks. So. If you're out there at the driving range having some uh, challenges going on, just know that that is natural. That is happening to everybody, and uh, I, so. I, I think so too because you know it's that competitiveness that goes on. Now, yeah. uh, with that, <laughs> I've got uh, Trot Golfer says no direct looking with uh, no, that no direct there. looking. No, Side eyeing. Look. I don't know if you if you know that you're the alpha there and that you're definitely the more dominant striker of the golf ball. I think you could probably turn and directly stare that person down after every time you get a shot. Mm. For sure. Yeah. That could be pretty it good. Might, that might be okay. Might be all right. Anyways. Well, let's move on. Let's keep it moving. Keep it grooving. We've got the pro golf recap in which we got to bring on our tour insider. Everybody, let's give it up for none other than Brent Grant. There we go. Man, that's the biggest applause that uh, I think you've gotten. <laughs> Even on the Corn Ferry Tour this past year. Next week. PG Tour Absolutely. the year before, you know. So uh, yeah, that was uh, that was quite quite fantastic out of our live audience here. But welcome to the show, Brent. How Hi. are you doing, buddy? I'm doing well, doing well, guys. Over here in uh, Marietta, California, at uh, first stage of Q School, caddying for my boy Jared Sawada, uh, getting uh, baked in the hot sun. It's about 90 degrees here, so uh, got a nice cherry tomato thing going on, got uh, a which shot. is great. Yeah, it's just a basically a straight line across my forehead. Fantastic. Uh, anything below that is is just roasted. But uh, other than that, doing great. Uh, How'd your boy play? Here. How are you guys doing? He played well today. Only made uh, two bad swings, shot three under. He's three back of the lead. We're just going to cruise on through and uh, get to second stage. Just keep on cruising, baby. Uh, I'm doing well. I, I'm I'm enjoying this studio, this solo. I was telling the guys, I might never have them back in the studio again. This is, I feel like I got room. I got the desk. I got the soundboard next to me. God, I just feel great about it. Yeah. Well, makes sense. You don't have a, you know, 200 ton buffalo sitting next to you or a, or <laughs> oh, a stick tree either. So, oh, that's you know, the type of episode. Room, <laughs> room, room of plenty. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't talking about Butsy. Sitting there breathing another man's burps for an hour. It's pretty nice. <laughs> Classic breathing bags. another man's burps. You know, burp as teeth. much as you burp and fart while you're here in studio, I don't think I've ever smelt anything that bad. No, because I fucking keep it cherry, dude. 
keep this thing <laughs> keep this thing clean until about three days from now. How, yeah, I so badly want to ask you: How do you keep your farts or burps smelling good? I have several masking agents that I use. <laughs> both, uh, well, I don't want to say rectally, but that's probably what it is. And then from the top <laughs> pole, and those two when they meet in the middle, clean. <laughs> That's fantastic. Wax on, wax off. Okay. Yeah. That is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that leads us right into the Shriners Open. I mean, I don't think there's a better segue in the world of live stream recordings of podcasts in the history the of the game. This was <laughs> this was perfectly transitioned by Butsy oh, to the Shriners yeah. Open in which we uh, got to see JT Poston shoot uh, 22 under. Now, the one thing about JT, he's been a little bit under the radar, I feel. I didn't realize he was in the top 50 and already was exempt next year for all of these signature series events, and it's uh, pretty interesting. He finished 41st um, in the FedEx Cup this past guy Tour Championship or FedEx Cup. I don't know what the hell to call it at this point. But uh, the mm. dude's got five top tens this year, and it just kind of snuck up on me. I, I wasn't really paying a whole lot of attention to JT Poston, but I, I want to get, uh, Brent, why don't we start with you on your take as to your take on JT Poston? The Postman. Uh, you know, silent assassin. Uh, but it just, the fact that he's gone under the radar uh, for pretty much most of the golfing world just shows you that... Uh, you know, the TV only, you know, the camera only focuses on certain people. But, uh, yep. yeah, I mean, he's just an ATM. He has been for the most majority of his career. I believe he's won John Deere twice. Um, but the fact that he was able to win uh, the way he was just, I mean, he played well on, on Saturday and Sunday and got it done. But it, it was it was a pretty dominant uh, performance all the way around. Shoot 22 under uh, on that golf course for four days, especially with Friday being gale force uh, is – is pretty impressive, but uh, I don't know, Buzzy. What do you think? <laughs> JT Poston. The only reason that I knew <laughs> that he's in the top fifty is because I bet ten dollars on him every week, thanks to DraftKings, because his odds are crazy, <laughs> and he's always up there. Otherwise, I wouldn't know. But that's uh, you guys should have just asked me. I fucking knew that already. So. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I already knew that. Perfect. I like his name too. It's a cool name. Yeah, and the nickname Postman, you know, that's pretty good. It's like a fighter pilot name, kind of. Mm. Is a Postman the same as a fighter pilot? Oh, well. So, <laughs> slightly <laughs> confused. <laughs> oh, that's kind of like it hurt. That like it hurt. Oh, you okay? I just farted. He is not okay. <laughs> Those roll aids are not going to work for very long. You know, there have been sure. people that have literally killed themselves because of how much they farted in a tight space, and they got uh, carbon dioxide poisoning, I believe. That's not um, true. That's true. You mean it's methane? Valid. Maybe, no, you're maybe about methane. Maybe methane. Dutch oven his wife, and she died because he put her under the covers. And I no, think that that's that's bones. not accurate. <laughs> you can't kill somebody like that. Just for that, just for that <laughs> myth, Mythbusters need to come back. Yeah, yeah, we 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 should do an episode of Mythbusters. All right, we should. Let, <laughs> second <laughs> second place here was Doug Gim, <laughs> Dougie Gim. He Las Vegas guy, Doug Gim. Dougie G. Yeah, Dougie G. Dougie G. Just he doesn't play very well, and then he pops up randomly every once in a while. Uh, he did come up big on Sunday as well. He shot a 65 to lose by one. So that was two shots better than JT Poston on Sunday. Uh, lost by and, one? Yeah. Talk to me about Dougie Gim there, good old Brent Graham. BG on the DG. Um, I played with him in Q school, actually, in uh, 2017, excuse me, 2018. And then uh, just kind of watched him just kind of do his thing. Uh, but he's he's struggled mightily. He's, I think he's gone through a couple coaches and, and umpteen caddies and, and whatnot. But uh, he's a phenomenal guy, uh, pretty consistent player as far as what he does best is, you know, there's nothing that's like outlandishly bad or outlandishly good. He's just kind of steady. But um, 
doesn't hit it that far, so he's already kind of at a disadvantage. But uh, yeah, I mean, he just basically saved his uh, next year with that uh, second place finish. So super happy for him. But uh, I don't, Butsy, can you breathe? Is that are we? Are you able to? <laughs> you look like you're holding Is your he breath. Alive? Is he alive? Is he okay? You okay? I'm fine. Don't worry about me. <laughs> oh, okay. He he's alive. Continue. Just check check your pulse. Doug um, Gim, yeah. you, you want to add yeah, any comments on Doug Gim, Dougie Gim there, Putsy? Again, another player. I just really like his name. <laughs> what does Doug Gim remind you of? What's the word association there? I don't know. I just like, if I knew him, he was a friend of mine, and I saw him out at the Dougie. golf course, I'd, I'd just be like, Gim! See, his name reminds me. Oh, my apologies, Putsy. Didn't mean to talk over you there. Go ahead. What? No, I, I didn't even... <laughs> didn't hear you. What did you say? I was just going to say that uh, Dougie Gim does remind me of uh, the guy who unfortunately passed away that sang the song Teach Me How to Dougie. I feel like he was referring to Doug Gim when he did that. That guy died? He died. What was that? Yeah. D. Ricky Graham or something like that, I believe his name was. That was was massive in middle school and high school. Oh, it was great. Teach me how to Dougie. Teach teach me how to Dougie. That's you Doug Gim. Sad, Press that sad cricket music button. button you Press can the, hit there real quick. Press the cricket button. Um, cricket. Yeah, let's go with. Yeah, Doug Doug Gim, everybody. All right, wow. so that's our that's our part of Doug Gim there. Let's move on to the leaderboard rundown for Doug the Shriners. Gim. We have Matty shit, <laughs> Matty shit, Matty Schmidt, oh, 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 and Rico no. Hoey. Or Hui, Hoey, 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 Hoey. At 19 under, those guys finished in third. Michael Kim, Davis Thompson, KH Lee, minus 18. Taylor Pendrith, who almost shot a 59 on day one, shoots 17 under. Harry Hall, Harris English, Gary Woodland, Alejandro Tosti, and Kirk Kitayama at minus 16. We need that Jeopardy. you need a Jeopardy button. As, that is, as you walk through that entire leaderboard. That is the top 10 for uh, the good old Shriners. And that's where we're wow. going to leave the Shriners for uh, this particular okay. episode. We're, well, we're moving and grooving. We're, we're, mo- we're moving and grooving. We're moving right into the Swanee style segment, folks. Ooh, Matt's favorite segment. I'm, it's not just my favorite segment. It's become the audience's favorite segment because I'm going to tell you right now. There was a lot of debate after last week around, and I couldn't believe how much this triggered people in regards to whether or not there should be a dress code on a public golf course. Mm. And both sides of the spectrum were coming at it. I mean, there's and autism. Lots, lots of both. And they, a lot of people, I will say that uh, they did not like the idea of no dress code. They uh, they really wanted to make sure the dress codes were still intact, and they related it. What's interesting about it is that they related the dress code to having uh, you know the things that golf teaches you as mm. a youth and so forth around etiquette and being a gentleman and all this. I just relate that to being a bunch of elitist bullshit. To be honest with you, I just think you know we need to make golf more. At, What's the what's the term for it? We need to make it more available. Careful. Oh, the, careful. The, there's a term for it. Um, but yes, make it, it more available. With, it doesn't start with an e. No, it doesn't. Egregious. No, <laughs> egregious. <laughs> egregious. <laughs> the uh, oh, no, oh. but that inclusive. being inclusive. Inclusive. There we go. There's the word. Thank you, Brent. Um, but making golf more inclusive. That is the absolute key. And that's why I said that my opinion has changed because I don't care if people are going to wear, you know, gym shorts or a tank top or whatever it may be. And that does not trigger me like that does not. I don't have a problem with somebody showing up to a golf course. I don't even have a problem. Oh, and by the way, because you mentioned jeans, Brent, people went off on that topic, too. They're like, why no jeans? If you're not going to have a dress code, why no you don't jeans? Care about just, Dickies overalls with no just, shirt on underneath, just, that doesn't bother you? No, I jeans. would love to see that. You kidding me? That'd be entertainment yeah. in and of itself. But people oh, then started relating. Mean? So the purists that are like, dress code, we need to have a dress code in the game of golf. They started chiming in around the fact that, you know, anybody who dresses poorly plays terrible. 
That's definitely not true. And that is not even close or remotely close. So I found that to be a pretty interesting topic. So along those lines with our Swanee style segment, the question that I'm going to ask the two of you, and we're going to go over the full outfit. So mm. what is your ideal golf outfit? If you could wear anything, there's no dress code. You can wear whatever you want. Butsy, I'm going to start with you from head to toe. What are you wearing? Just want to touch on your prior point there, Matt. Oh. I have never played with somebody that broke 80 in a wife beater. So <laughs> uh, fuck that point. Wait, 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 wait. Get ready to say that again. Go <laughs> ahead in three, two, one. I have never ever oh, oh. played with somebody that broke 80 in a fucking wife beater. Oh, hang on. A fucking <laughs> fucking <laughs> fucking <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Oh, that, that was so terrible. Oh, that timing man. was awful. No, because so I I missed the button. I ended up pressing something else and it got <laughs> got out of hand. Got absolutely out of hand. He typed an entire essay on that board in order to find the. You, oh, I got it. You need to. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm watching down here and trying to stay. What oh, the man. fuck was that? that <laughs> what do you want me to say? Butsy's favorite button. You just push the G spot right there. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> There's oh, yeah. there's a few that you know when the <laughs> audio and en- when we're back in studio and even when we have all three of us and the audio engineers in here, oh, um, actually going to be recording some little uh, some little sound bits too that we can use on the show. So going to go over there Thursday and record some stuff. Jordan, shout out to you, buddy. But yeah, let's. Uh, I I completely right. lost track. So Butsy, what yeah, is your about- ideal oh, golf outfit from? Top to bottom, to if tell. there was no dress code, um, the same as it is today. I think I, I like I like higher end fabrics. I don't think they have to be tucked in. That's about as crazy as I'm going to get. Shorts. I like the idea of like a tennis short above the knee. Uh, again, very high end <laughs> light fabrics. Nice polo. I think your shoe game needs to be on fucking point. If you roll out there with some duct tape fucking slides on. No. And if you wear foot joy green joys, I'm not playing golf with you. But um, a hat, wear a hat if you want to. If you have great, like, flowing Jesus Christo hair, like, fucking let that shit go. Mine's not like that. And I'm sponsored as fuck, so I got to wear a hat. So that's where I'm at with it. Okay. Brent, what about you, buddy? Oh, man. I like what Chalk Golf said, aside from the jean shorts. <laughs> Oh man, head to toe. Uh, definitely a bucket hat, uh, an athletic style t shirt. So, like something that's, you know, the famous moisture wicking fabrics, mm. kind of like what Butsy said. Um, any type of, any type of workout short doesn't matter. Um, anything mid knee, slightly above the knee. Uh, and then we're going to go with, uh, no show socks with, uh, metal spikes. Oh, I like what you said. No show socks. Those tall tube socks. They look like fucking trash. Yeah. Don't do it. You gotta have the calves for it. Don't do it. Don't do it. I mean, you know, the calves that work for it are actually the calves that are tiny. Yeah, Mm. exactly. It's for the guys that miss leg day. Correct. They're for nickels. They're for people that just, their knee goes straight into their fucking foot. Interesting, like almost like a cankle. No, like a, like no. a nickel. Yeah, a nickel. <laughs> a nickel. A ne- n- knackle. Something very thin. Now, my answer to this is twofold. So I've got oh one that is more casual if it's nice and cool outside. If it's cool outside, I want to wear a hoodie, something like the Swanee's Camden. And then I want to wear like jogger sweatpants. I want sweatpants oh. out there. I love. Rock and there's such nice materials now for sweatpants that they don't even look like sweatpants. I just don't have the balls to walk up to a golf course, even a public golf course, with a with a semi dress code and rocking sweatpants. I just don't feel right about it. So I would love if there was no dress code, hoodie, sweatpants, done. Now, 
if even if there was no dress code on a nice warm day, I'm rocking regular golf shorts. I am rocking a Swanee's polo. I am rocking a hat. I'm rocking no show socks and I'm rocking Jordans. That that's the golf outfit right there. And most likely 90% of the time I'm rocking an alligator white belt, white cream oh, belt. Oh my God. Yep. Man, you yeah. might've just stirred up the entire universe with that one. Yeah. So Matt, to your point though, like I think we're in the same boat on this. I just like wearing a polo. Yeah, I, I'm fine with polo. I That's like the it. thing. I think I like when it. I think when Brent and I were talking about it last week that and that clip came out that people were like, oh, my God, these guys just want to wear whatever. Like it actually if there was no dress code, it really wouldn't change what I wear unless it was cold conditions. No, it would change yeah. what I wear. You'd wear a Barney onesie. <laughs> I lost a bet. If I had uh, no dress code, uh, I got several. I'm already with my overalls and everything. Like, there's, oh my there's a line. Yeah, and there is a line. That, that line is a speedo. And by the way, you just shouldn't rock it at all, ever. Interesting. Even in what public. About guys going commando on the golf course under their golf shorts. That's a ballsy move. Or the old uh, Northwestern uh, fall trick where you wear basketball shorts underneath your rain pants because you know you're not going to take your rain pants off oh i used to do that i used to do that a lot in new york yeah it's a, it's a must that it's a must have kind of brilliant it is uh yeah. brent do you feel yeah. what you wear on tour is a uniform absolutely absolutely there there's there is uh there's a strict i mean there is a strict dress code so i mean they have obviously kind of pushed a little bit with like hoodies and and you know some of these like super long uh like button down shirts have kind of been seen but for the most part uh you've got to have your shirt tucked in um they, i don't agree with the joggers i don't think that you know you should be wearing pants that go this high above your shoe and it's you know ankle tight they and like shit it's, they're you know, so bad. Butsy, so you bad. were wearing joggers literally the Not other day. like those, though. You know, you had literally joggers on. However, you unzipped oh. the bottom so it didn't fully look like it was a jogger. I noticed. Correct. I saw that. Correct. Brent, <laughs> why do you wear a cup on tour when you don't play baseball? It's just in case when I'm hitting my bunker shots, I don't I don't nail myself with the, the butt end of the club. I'm you pretty sure he does it for the bulge, though. man. He does it right? for the bulge. I mean, it just I mean, looks just like gotta a hold it in. I'm not, I'm not looking or anything, but like you're looking. It's okay. But what does the audience think about Brent wearing a cup? <laughs> They love it. Gotta, they absolutely the love two it. Intro, bro. Gotta protect that the one guy in the audience is hammered. He Dude, hammered. Screams the same thing. <laughs> it's crazy. Ah! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> oh man. But yeah, I mean, even my even my dad, who who uh, wore a uniform for thirty years, said that's exactly what it is. So, yeah, why not? It's a uniform. Brent, what? Who is your apparel sponsor? Trout golfer wants to know. Who is my? Oh, is that what he said? I'm sorry. I'm trying not to look yeah. at the computer. Uh, Trot, my apparel sponsor currently is Asher Golf out of uh, out of Utah. Really, really nice company. With uh, they've taken care of me this year, and um, ten out of ten recommend checking them out. And by the way, so Brent, we have a promo code through them for their oh. golf gloves and stuff, right? I believe so. Hold on. Is it pull hook twenty? Is it pull hook twenty? I believe it's pull hook twenty. That's fantastic. So, oh man, you now go. you're going to make, I can't even go to my phone. My phone's the camera. It's so. all right. I believe but, it's pull hook 20. Give that a try there, Trot. Apparently they've got the fantastic. nicest gloves in the game. Cabretta they leather. Actually do. They actually do. So. Which Brent, why don't you tell us what Cabretta leather is? It is, it is stone made, like literally made out of, uh, it's goat leather. Did you say stone, stone made? Stone, stone made. made. What, what does leather. that mean? Stone made. Made by so they, ta they take the leather, the goat leather, they kill, you know, unfortunately the goat and they lay it out and they, and they pound it out on stone. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's different levels to it. And Asher actually has the triple a Cabretta leather supply. Triple a. Yeah. 
That's very close to the major leagues. Mm-hmm. So they just beat this goat on the rock. Yeah. Yep. That's how they get it out. They it's just... yeah. <laughs> That is oh going. We are definitely adding a goat sound to the soundboard. <laughs> 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 you don't even, yeah, just that sound right there, actually. We're definitely oh going to get Butsy to record some voices for us as oh. well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear Lord. Oh How are God. we supposed to even move on from the Swanee segment after that? I think we stick right there. We should just stay and on the Swanee style segment for the rest of the show. People All right, love it. Let's, I don't know. What does the audience think? The audience, yeah, who knows? I mean, come on, audience, where are you? <laughs> Poor Trot like is running a solo eff- effort here with all these comments. I love it, Trot. Hold Don't on, stop. hold on. Do you feel like you wear a uniform? What's your apparel spell? So I can smell like, okay, sorry. Trot Golfer yeah, does sorry. want to know. I can, up. or he, not that he wants to know. He says he can smell that glove through the phone. So got that going for you, which is nice. Now, that's nice. The Zozo Championship. This is where our word association started with good old Butsy. We got the Accordia Golf Narashino Country Club. Mm. Opened in 1965 by Shinya Fujita. Okay? Mm. And that is a par 70 golf course, 7,079 yards. Tiger won this in 2019. There's the GOAT signal right there every time we mention Tiger Woods. Yep. (laughs) Yeah, we just need that. <laughs> need that on repeat right there. Now, let's go, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Brent, for Brent's breakdown of this oh golf my. tournament, the Zozo Championship. My goodness. Well, first thing that these guys are going to have to battle is jet lag. So, uh, yeah. fortunately, a large percentage of the field is, uh, is probably already over there or has been over there for a little while. But uh, you need about three days. Uh, of basically getting back into a routine because it, it just, I think it, it just completely messes you up. I mean, it's a, at least a 10 hour trip um, from most places in the States. So um, yeah, I mean, when Tiger won, I think it was, I think it was kind of a chilly, kind of a wet and rainy, rainy time. So weather's definitely going to play a factor. It's a different type of grass, uh, which is another thing these guys are going to have to deal with. Um, but I believe it's it's a shorter golf course, seven thousand yards. It's tight, um, so it's really just about hitting fairways, getting the right spot on the greens, and and as always, making putts. I'm curious what your opinion is, and Butsy, what your opinion is around the fact that we're kind of in the middle of this season for the guys that are not really in the top fifty. And this fall series that's been going on that gives guys that are deeper in the rankings chances to compete and actually try to win golf tournaments. And then all of a sudden you throw in the Zozo championship and now you got a lot of big names that are out there. And this is kind of a tournament to where it's a more of a select field, I'll say, uh, versus kind of that broader grouping of players. What's he? I mean... I don't really have words for it, to be honest with you. You're saying that, so you're you're at, you're at the shitter events, and then we throw in like a big one. Yeah, this is kind of a bigger event. I feel like. Help me understand what you mean. Well, it's a bigger event, and some of the top players are playing in it, but also it goes by rankings, where you know a lot of players can't get into this tournament that are in the lower rankings. I mean, I'm just going to completely pull this out of my ass here, per normal, but. <laughs> I would imagine that's like a good way to maybe keep viewership. Like, you know, I don't know. Keep people enticed this late into the the season, maybe. I don't know. I think that's what we've been doing. Well, Well, we do that, obviously. (laughs) We are, the the PGA Tours, you know, is beholden to us. So, yeah, I don't have a great answer to that question, Matt. I do apologize. Usually I'm pretty good at uh, manufacturing one, but. Yeah, I, I'm dry on that. He's got nothing, Brent. What about you, buddy? I'm excited about it. Yeah, I mean, if we could name, you know, half the players in the field, it'd probably be great. But um, yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line is is money talks, and I don't know if you've got a a cash cha ching there on your soundboard, but uh, I wish I had it. Those all paid a pretty penny to be where they're at, and that's and, hey, more power to them. Um, 
that, that, no. I feel like Bewitched just entered the room. I don't like that. That's the, maybe magical. <laughs> That's like it doesn't get better with the more whenever, you play. Whenever it. anybody has like a real special moment. <laughs> It's like a kid on Christmas with the soundboard here. Dude, I'm I'm in love. Yeah, again. There you go. Do the do the little No, the other one. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> oh my god. It's like when you take our 90% gets there. equipped. Oh. Folks, if you're listening to the podcast right now, the podcast version without the video, man, you need to pop on the video on Spotify <laughs> or on great. YouTube. Oh, man, because there's some special stuff going on right now with facial expressions and just tons of ideas are just so forming bad. right now. This might be the episode that leads to just soundboard greatness in the future. I like the soundboard a lot. Yeah. It's the people going. It really does. <laughs> that, okay. All right. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Hell of a take, okay, Brent. Hell of a take. Okay, let's go over the Aeon Next 10, folks. We've been really getting in to the Aeon Next 10 lately. And literally, it is just a whole between 51st to 60th. It's just very incestual right now to where they're just moving around a little bit inside of each other. Um, we've got Mackenzie Hughes in 51st, Harris English in 52nd, uh, good old Seaman Power in 53rd. You gotta love some good old Seaman Power, Seamus Power, that is. Uh, 54th is Patrick Rogers, 55th is Maverick McNeely, then we got 56 with Tom Kim. Tom Kim is, is falling down a <laughs> bit, so... That's uh that's an interesting one. 57th is Justin Rose, 58th is Nick Taylor, then we got the sleeper Jake Knapp, and we got uh, number 60 with Kevin Yu. Lucas Glover did not move up at all. He's still in 61st. Maybe Tom Kim will learn karma's real, acting like a little bitch in the president's code. Wow. Yeah, Calling out man. Tom Kim. That's a great. Yeah, lay the you can down, take him, dude. You can take him. And down goes my <laughs> score now. Yeah, down in the rank. Yeah. Tom Kim and Doug. <laughs> oh my God. Field analysis and betting odds, my friends. We've got Xander Shoffley is playing this week, so clearly he's going to be the favorite at plus 450. We've got Colin Morikawa at plus 650. Hideki Matsuyama at 750. Uh, Sungjae is at 1400. We got Sahith Gala at 1800. Justin Thomas at 2000. Kirk Kitayama. Plus twenty two hundred. Yeah, can you believe Justin Thomas is playing and his wife is almost due for giving birth, and he's over well, is, in Japan. Is, is is she a month away, like Scotty Scheffler's wife was? I think she's closer oh. than Scotty's was. I think well, like luck. she's due within a, like a week or two. Oh my gosh! Good luck to them, and uh, yeah, wish them all the best. Love that for them. I could be just spewing misinformation there as well, so that's great. Pronounce disinformation. Uh, fake news. Kurt Kitayama yeah. plus twenty two hundred. Mm -hmm. Minwoo Lee at plus twenty eight hundred. Bo Hostler, mm -hmm. Will Zalator, Siwoo Kim at plus thirty five hundred. We got Maverick McNeely and Dougie Gim at plus four thousand. Yeah. JJ Spawn, one of Butsy's favorites, at plus forty five hundred. Then we got <gasps> good old Seaman Power once again here with Tom Hoagie, uh, Max Homa plus five thousand, and then. We kind of rounded out with Eric Cole and Max Grazerman at plus 5,500. I turn it to you, Butsy. Who's your pick for the week? This is tough. I feel like Tiger Woods. anybody with a last name with M, Kim, Lee, or Yama at the end of it has a pretty good chance that they're going to probably play pretty good here. And, uh, yeah, I'm going with Hadek. Hadek. Hadek okay. to the E to the Mots to the Yama. Okay. M, Kim, Lee, Yama. Truck Offer wants to know, do you have to pick an Asian this week? It is part of the prerequisite. No, yes. <laughs> but I just, that's like yes. saying, who you know, am I going to win at the sushi bar or a Texas roadhouse? Like, mm. Mm. 
Probably both mm, places. But, probably both. Come on. Yeah. Let's don't yeah, sell yourself. Yeah, you just gotta take time. food out of the motherfucking equation and it'd be fair. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anti lips pick is uh, Tom De Teeth Hoagie. Oh Jesus! You got Hoag? No, no, oh, no. Boy. That that's anti lips pick this week. No. Who's Trot no. going with? Yeah, who is Trot going with? He said Zach Zach Blair. He's oh going yeah, like, he did. So uh, Brant, who you got this week? Oh my God. Anybody with a ama awa, any sort of like that? <laughs> ama awa ili kim kim. <laughs> oh hell! You know I'll go with. Uh, I think Colin Morikawa actually won this uh, mm. year. Ago. Stole my pick. I forgot about him. About him. That's I'll a go good with one. Kari Morikawa. That's a good one. He's a very good. I am gonna go just because you took you stole my pick. I am gonna go with Minwoo Lee this week. Mm. Good old Min Woo. Could so be a wrong. huge mistake. Okay. Yeah. Z- Xander Shoffley is in the field. Everybody. He is. Yeah. yeah well, we can't true. go with the most obvious one. I just feel is like not playing? I really loved the Colin Morikawa pick. So I'm, I'm just sorry. gonna say that. It's a good Trot, pick. Would you pick would you take long hard banger if he got a sponsorship exemption? <laughs> <laughs> as long as he can anchor. Whoa. Kyle over at the Carp Barn Guys chimes in with Luke List is the winner. Wow. Kyle Mays, everybody. Now, he did have a spirit call like a month ago or some shit. He did. Where he was correct. And I don't even think he Ooh. meant to be Ooh, correct. let's talk about that. A, I think it was a joke. Yeah, well, we're pretty sure it was a joke he threw out there. And it ended up, that player ended up winning. Let's, let's talk Singh. about Moss Brucker's comment there. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Will Zelatoris ever going to be good again, or did the injury bug wreck him? Well, that's you've a good got question. A injury right now. How's that feel? Huh? What? I'm sorry. The back is say? the one thing you never want to mess with as a golfer. Is that what's Will going Zalatoris. on with, Will with Zalatoris. Zalatoris. Yeah, he had that uh, the fusion surgery, right, in the lower back? Yeah, I rode in the middle seat all the way here today. I know exactly. It's not fucking good. I'm in a wheelchair right now. So what do you think? you ever think he's going to be good again? Ah, That's tough because he was kind of right at that mid-fiery, like starting to peak, and then all that just disappears. You get a couple years older, and now what? I mean, he was finishing top five in every major up until the back injury. Yeah, that's tough. What do you think, Matt? I think he will. I think it takes a long time to recover from that back injury. I mean, if you look at, yeah. So if you look at Tiger Woods, for instance, Tiger's kind of a prime example, had a million back surgeries. You look at how long did it take Tiger to get back into form? And it took him a couple years in order to get back from the actual back injury. And I just think Willie Z, like he's... He was 38th, by the way, on the FedEx Cup this year. Yeah, I mean, it's not like he played terrible in coming back. I just think it's no. going to take him a little bit to get back to that form to where he's potentially a top 10 player in the world. Is he healed? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I saw him uh, in Nashville, and okay. he he was he was hitting it great, feeling great. I think he's felt that way for a long time. Um, we, we played a practice round together, shoot, almost two years ago. When he was fresh off the fresh off the kind of, I guess he was not on the injured reserve or anything like that, but um, had just come off of a huge break, and and he said he was feeling good then. So I mean, he's had two years to do it. He, he placed in the top ten three times this year, um, and obviously played played well enough to be thirty eighth in the in the overall ranking. So, see, um, when you put it that way, though, that's a good point. So now, like my opinion completely changes. Yeah, he I mean, be, what's good, right? I mean, he because he doesn't be. win or what is that? I mean, most professionals go their entire career without winning a single turn. Well, I think Willie Z was heading towards being a part of that elite class of like the top 10 players that could win multiple times every single year. And that's the trend that we we're looking at. I mean, we also have to take into consideration, too, that Funny. he did revamp his entire golf swing. So he does not have the same move that he previously had. Is he playing this week? Yes. I'm putting money on him tonight. There you go. Love that. Jeff, you uh, you led Butsy to putting in some money on some good old Will Zalatoris this week. Love that. Can we, Can we? I mean, what's what's good? 
right? Like, like. I think there's levels, Brent. What does that mean? What does that mean? Like, I think there's levels to it. I think there is, you know, you got your top 10 guys. Those are guys that you expect to win on a yearly basis at least once. But these are guys that can win multiple times. Then you've got the kind of your core top names, right, that are kind of from 10 to, let's say, 40. And then from there, you've got guys that are talented enough, but they need to get hot at the right time in order to win. And that's pretty much everybody else on the PG Tour, in my opinion. So you kind of have this group. And that's where I think Will Zalatoris was becoming part of that group that you expected him to win on a yearly basis, basis, if not more than once. And especially when it came to the majors. I mean, shit, the guy finished second at the Masters his very first year playing the masters. And then I believe finished top five or top 10 the following year, and then had to withdraw the uh, third year. But again, Will Zalatoris, he was trending in that direction. And that's why I think there's expectations. But once again, I'll say it. Expectations are the killers of dreams. They are. They are. I don't know, but what do you think? What's good? What, what is considered good? <clears throat> oh man. I mean, I reference Patty P all the time for uh, for his tour career. I think that's good. I think I think if you can uh, consistently make a living at the highest level, you're pretty fucking good. Uh, if for an extended period, if you can have a career in golf at the highest level on the highest stage, you're good. Like you're fucking good. <laughs> so half of half of Butsy's face feels that way. By the what? way, just so we're clear cameras <laughs> see my back is just fucked right now i'm trying to like, oh you gotta understand i'm like literally like half laying on this table because this fucking camera angle fuck oh. okay oh hang on go ahead again <laughs> that was great timing <laughs> there we go there we go guys well done claps claps well done Folks, we are like little kids in a candy store right now with this soundboard. Nice. I love it. Absolutely love it. What about you, Brian? What What is good to you? I, especially being a guy that has played on the PG Tour, has played on the Corn Ferry Tour. I mean, tell us what, what you think what, is good. What's good? What's good, buddy? Um, I think I think to to pay respect to to Jeff's question, um, obviously. You know, like you said, the, the expectation of winning, right? Um, but from the average viewer, right? Good. That's that's all that matters is is whether or not they're competing to win or they're winning, and that's considered a high level of play, right? That's considered oh well, they're they're playing good because they're you know, or they're a great player or they're a good player because they're winning or whatever. Um, now. Unfortunately, and, and like most times, um, what the average viewer thinks is not re is not really based in, in reality. It's just kind of what they see on TV and they kind of base their expectations off that. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but if you, for example, place 20th on the PGA Tour and you make eighty five to ninety thousand dollars, did you play good that week? Probably pretty good considering there's one hundred and fifty six players in the field. Right. But you never got any TV time. You 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 got a few points, you know, uh, but if you do that for 15 tournaments, that's really good because that's obviously really high level, consistent of play across multiple courses across the whole year and all that other stuff. So um, the issue is, is, like you said, expectations of Will Zal Taurus are always going to be very high. Um, but I can tell you based on just conversations with him. Um, he's chomping at the bit. So I would be on the lookout for Will uh, to win very, very soon uh, within yeah. probably the next six months. Will. Will. So Love cool. that. Cups they do, glove manufacturer they do make a right-handed cadet glove. <laughs> it's called PXG. PXG, number one prayer in the world. They have a right-hand cadet. Beautiful. Yeah, we should do a whole podcast in the Asian accent. Just no, no, we it should is have designed <laughs> from a mud mold of Bob Parsons' right foot. That is that is another perfect segue into the live golf updates, folks. He has cadet hope. He's got. 
and live golf updates. Um, <laughs> we've got players. Okay. This, I actually found this to be really interesting and I had to make some phone calls today what? in order to get down to the bottom of this, but players right now that were not in the drop or not in the relegation zone. So they were in the open zone. We have our first player that's been released and his contract is not being renewed. I'll and play. That is, go ahead. <laughs> why, don't, why don't you give it a guess? I'll play. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Brent. No, I, no, I didn't no who do you think it is? Well, I don't have to think because you are. You oh, know, you already know. know. Okay. So it is Eugenio Shakara, who, who Sergio Garcia. So he won in the first year of Live Golf. And what? really, yeah, he did. He, he had a win um, over in, oh, gosh, was it? Uh, it was the Asian one, Singapore, I believe. One of those mm. um, that they played over and he ended up winning. And then this year he finished 39th overall. So he only had one top 10 in 2024, but he was safe, right? However, you are not safe anymore if you are in that open zone, which Sergio Garcia is like, no, nope, sorry, dude, not renewing your contract. And that leads into the next question, which is, is this a trend that we're going to continue to see, especially yeah, this year where most contracts are expiring? So remember, a lot of these guys got three-year deals. Some of them got less and they've already renewed and so forth, but these guys, and let me give some context here. So as I was talking um, to several insiders about this, they've stated that Liv is not going to continue to provide these lucrative contracts to players. This is now the team's responsibility. So the captains that were given 25% equity in the team, guess what? They've got to come up with the contracts. They've got to pay them. And so this leads to a whole new dynamic. So I wonder, is this going to be the trend that we're going to see uh, moving forward where some guys that are not in live right now and what's going to happen to these guys that are outside of live? So Brent, I'll start with you, man. Wow. Um, I mean, as per usual, I didn't know any of that. Um, you know, I hear whispers about what happens uh, on the live tour and um yeah, I mean, the tough part about that is, is the moment that you put uh, all of these decisions amongst guys that have never really had to manage people, um, they've never really had to lead people necessarily, um, you know, over a long period of time and have to make decisions that could theoretically put somebody in a position where they're, they don't have a job. And um, those decisions are very difficult to make, obviously. Sergio uh, had no problem making that to well, his fellow Sergio, Spaniard. Yeah, that's he. Yeah, that's he might be making. Yeah, John Rom might consolidate his team and just be like pack it in, and then he goes plays with with Garcia. Who knows? Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think what you're going to end up seeing is is you're going to see um, some of these bigger name guys that do have the ability to bring in that kind of investment from outside companies. Uh, what you're going to see is um, them hiring people essentially that that either A, really fit the team and that'll probably be their first priority uh, and then B, as a second priority that don't cost too much. Um, it, it's just, it's a, it's, a, it's a shit show and I don't, I don't envy any of those guys that got to make those decisions, but I will happily uh, put my name in the hat for uh, to replace whoever that guy was. Anti-Live just asked the question, are Live teams their own legal entity now? And the answer to that is yes. They're technically their own franchises. They're a franchise like a baseball club. Exactly. So, Batsy, uh, what's your take on it? You think this is something that we're going to see a lot more of? Well, did these guys know this the whole time? I don't, I don't believe it was super clear to these players that this is where it was heading because this is the first year that we've had this open zone, so to speak, to where teams can drop players if they don't feel like they performed. And granted, these contracts are coming up, so it's like, okay, do I re-sign Eugenio Shakara to, and who knows what those negotiations were, right? Between him and Sergio or his agent and Sergio or whoever's running the fireball team. Yeah, These are so, things that are interesting. 
I think it's going to be just like a baseball club. Like if it continues down this path, these owners, these team owners are going to hire managers and like, yeah, it, it'll work itself out that way. They're, they're going to manage it like they would any other team. So they're going to mm-hmm. pay guys to do statistics and come in and manage and coach and fire Interesting. I mean, just like any business would, right? Yeah. And that's the key. I mean, they got to be able to generate revenue. They got to be able to pay the players. They need to make sure that they're making money. And I found it pretty interesting around a lot of this that cool. is starting to transform and take place with Live Golf. And Truck Golfer wants to know what about Bubba Watson, who is the captain of the Range Goats, but he was in the drop zone. So I've been told that with Bubba, which it is not a hundred percent certain how Greg Norman is kind of working this entire thing out with the captains because last year captains couldn't be relegated this year. They could. And Bubba Watson ended up in that relegation mode. So I don't know if he's got to go back and try to requalify through well, the tournament or not. It would be like a, like an owner player, right? In the big leagues, like, if you no longer possess the skill to be playing on the team, like you still own, but you're not on the field. Right? That's where I think it's going to head with Bubba Watson. I think he, yeah. I, I don't even know if he's going to try to qualify. He might say, Fuck it. Yeah. Yeah. Could he, I mean, I, I guess I, let me see, see how to phrase this. Is it possible that a lot of these things actually take away from like, because I mean, it, it almost adds a, a layer of of just. It seems to be very, very complicated. I mean, there's just it's just a, a constant amount of these changes and rules and difference differences year to year. And I understand they're trying to figure things out and and whatnot. But I mean, is it is it that the PIF has pretty much said, you know what, we're not going to fork over the you know hundreds of millions of dollars that it costs to travel you know, five, six guys, you know, for 13 teams or whatever it is. And they just decided, Hey, you know what? We're, we're done spending the money on you guys and you guys got to do it yourself. Is that, is that kind of what you're hearing or it is, it's kind of where, you know, Piff wanted to work out a deal with the PGA tour. PGA tour has been reluctant in terms of getting that deal done and hasn't been able to. So Piff now they're at the end of the three years. Right. That was what all these initial contracts were. So it's like, okay, we brought over these guys. We've signed big names so that you could have additional players and so forth. Now it's up to you as the team captains and owners to actually issue out contracts and to pay these guys. And you're supposed to be doing that through your team earnings, through your individual earnings that you're making. And that's where I'm like, is this enough to keep these guys to stay with live golf? Like if you're a Bryson DeChambeau, for instance, and which I, that, this might be the worst example because Bryson's pretty, pretty much live golf. Like he is kind of known as live golf right now, right? Him and Brooks Kepka are the two sure. guys, so to speak. But is this enough to keep a Bryson there? If all of a sudden Bryson isn't going to get another massive contract, he's like, oh shit, like what am I supposed to do? Are they under are they obligated to be there? That's the other thing. Their contracts are done, but they are technically owners of these franchises. So I guess that's the incentive, right? Like mm-hmm. when John Rahm's contract was talked about with the $600 million, right? That also was like, part of that is the equity from the team. And they valued that at some oh, magical okay. number Interesting. to be a part of that. So that's where it's like, okay, so each of these guys have their equity in their teams. Like all the captains of the teams have their owners of those teams. So I think it would, I think it'll work, but is live still going to like, who's going to pay for the ballpark? Like is live still paying for the venue? Yes. Is live still, is live still funding? Yep. You know, the purses all these, and all that. Yep. They're still funding all the purses. Shit. They're still fun. Like they're still taking then, yeah. care of all that other stuff, yeah. but you got to imagine like, if you're signing somebody to your team, how well, much are you signing them for? Like these contracts good. aren't disclosed, by the way. So it's like when mm-hmm. I'm digging into these this information, it's like, okay, 
we got to be hush hush in regards to like who they're signing and for how much, but this is going to be an interesting season for us because we've got some insiders from the agent side of things that we're going to be able to get some of this information before it's released and announced. So like we might end up knowing who Sergio Garcia's teammate is before or who he ends up going with before it ever gets announced. And we might actually know the actual contracts amount as well. I'm really yeah. cheap. I'll just put that out there. <laughs> really cheap. I mean, we got to talk great. to the right, we yeah. got we to network and talk to the right people. We got to get this guy's name in the hat. I think somehow, you so know, not a bad a idea, people. not a bad idea. Let's throw but, him um, in there to, uh, back to your point though. Yeah. I think this still works, man. You know, uh, PJ tour, you got to be a top guy to make five million dollars a year. And there's right? no contracts. So, and the, no on the PGA contract. Tour, that's something to consider as well. It's like, hey, you're not guaranteed shit. If you give a guy yeah. three point, you say, hey, I'll give you three point five to come play on my team for a year, and if we're fucking good and we raise a bunch of money, then there'll be some incentive bonuses and stuff for you as well. Um, what do you say? And if this guy's a fucking, you know, outside of the top fifty. On the PGA Tour, like why wouldn't yeah, you? yeah, yeah, they're not going to get a hundred million like Rom and those guys did early on, but you don't need a hundred million <laughs> to yeah. be swayed away yeah. from the PGA Tour. Yeah, I agree with that. And I agree. the other question ends up becoming: so since they're put, positioning this and putting this onto the captains of each of the teams, are they going to continue to try to bring over PGA tour players in the process? So if this deal isn't struck with the PGA tour, are they going to try to throw out a billion dollars to a Rory McIlroy, for instance, that's the other thing that I'm not quite sure of. Like if you're a team owner and you're like, hang on a second, you sign me to this massive deal. You are bringing this guy over. Like, are they going to create a new franchise and bring over more people? That's going to be an interesting part to this as well. And we actually have a, couple comments here by Ben Hogan, 1953. I didn't know Ben Hogan was still alive. That's great. Live supporters have long said that Piff can afford to keep funding live <laughs> in perpetuity and to give them five, no wait, now 10 years for their plans to come to fruition. Uh, the other side to this is why would Piff fund a product that isn't producing a profit for 10 years? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I don't have an answer to that. And I mean, PIF is probably the only ones like the, the board that's on PIF are probably the only ones that could provide that specific uh, answer. Um, but I, I don't think they're going to let this die. Like they're yeah, getting no, smarter in regards to how much they're spending though. They'll do it for fun. They'll do it for. Yeah, an hour. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree. But see, I think, I think the, again, the misconception is that there is a, uh, there is some sort of um, push for profit to be made. Um, you know, these guys got 25% of their equity. I guess where where I get a little lost is if they've got 25%, who's got the 75% PIF? Yeah, okay. so, so they want to, so here's the other side to it, right? Is that, yes, the teams are responsible for the contracts now, for negotiating that with the individual players and everything to come on to their team. However, PIF being 75% owner, what they were looking at is that they're going to try to sell the franchises at some point. And that gives the captain the ability to be a minority owner at 25%. And then some big owner will end up coming in. It's basically that their ideal situation is what the TGL has done where they brought in the Fenway group. They brought in, you know, all these different, like Arthur Blank in Atlanta um, and having all these team owners that are responsible for all of that and own the franchises. So with PIF, eventually they're hoping that they can offload those franchises and make their money back that way. Yeah, Hogan just said it. Uh, and, yeah. and, that's, and that's what we've been talking about for years. Um, Anybody that anybody that's ever been around business with with the Saudis uh, should should know that uh, should know that that's exactly what they're trying to do. They've done it with F one. They've done it with football, soccer, um, football. They've done it football. football. Uh, they've done it. Uh, they've attempted to do it with tennis. 
uh, and, and a few other sports as well. Um, but I think, again, and I think that that's why, you know, to, to answer, to, to at least attempt to answer the, the, the question of whether or not they keep attempting to sign new talent, um, they're going to run into the same issue that the PGA Tour has run into, um, which is that there's not a superstar in every single class that comes out of college. And that's it, it. There's just not. Um, that's not to say there aren't really good players. There's not to say that there aren't high level elite players, but a superstar, somebody like a John Rahm, somebody like a Roy McElroy, um, you know, are literally, you know, once every 10 years, maybe. I mean, Rory's got John by shoot, I, I think at least 10 years. Um, so, you know, to, to say that, that, you know, they're going to be able to keep the same level of player coming in and out every year is going to be very difficult. So um, the only thing is, and I guess I would ask this question to you guys and the viewers as well, is that so let's say that the deal doesn't get done, right? Let's say that, that you know, the Justice Department or, or the PJ Tour, whatever, whatever happens, the, the, the deal never goes through. Um, you know, are we just basically stuck with the TGL live and the pga tour being borderline separate entities and they're just kind of doing their own thing and you just got multiple different types of golf to watch and then you know that's kind of it like what what do you guys think happens probably I, yeah <laughs> it's that that that's a yeah but barkley actually had a funny quote when asked about this on a podcast on sirius xm he was asked about is it smart or something along those lines for Piff and the PGA Tour to stay separate? And he goes, these guys are idiots. Absolutely. Hang on. Absolutely. So with that, they uh, they are not in a it, – it's so bad for the game of golf. But I just don't see at this what point is- the separation – Right. You think it's interesting. I think it's terrible for the game of golf. I I've think never it's, thought about that. I think it's bad for the fans not to be able to mm-hmm. see outside of the majors. And that was Barkley's other point. These oh, guys yeah. need to be playing against each other more than four times a year. And totally that being said, they really need to figure out a way. And it might just be the fact that they got to let these live guys start playing in PGA Tour events again. And that's really they, all they have to do. That's it. Yeah. It, and so it's, it's 10 events a year worldwide. They play for a bunch of money. I think we're seeing it with the DP World <laughs> Tour that there's no real effect by having these guys play on it other than you make more money because they're playing in these events. People are yeah. more interested in that. Um, I don't see this deal going through. I don't see Piff being a major investor in the PGA Tour. I think the U.S. government is going to have too much of a hand in diving into the books and then they've got to open it up for PIF. I think the PG tour politically is still lobbying and trying to figure out a way through this. I think that's the ultimate holdup. I don't actually believe the narrative that they've thrown out there, that it's the players on the board that are not allowing anything to go through uh, because mm-hmm. the players have the control right uh, now, knowing some of the players that are on that board that uh, are in control, yeah, I can see that being uh, a factor, but I think there's a pathway to get this done. I just don't see it happening. Um, and that's disappointing for the fans and everything. I mean, this is, we're, we're not well, going to see it this year at least. Yeah. I mean, but let's, let's, let's look at that. Right. I mean, what's disappointing um, for the fans, right? I mean, think about all of the decisions that have been made over the last two or three years on the PGA tour alone. One of which, by the way, was that Jay completely ignored Mr. Norman and and uh, and didn't pick up the phone, which is all he had to do, uh, and at least hear him out. And then it just it spiraled and just cascaded into multiple decisions where we're left with uh, A, B, and C tour uh, within the same 150 players, and they you know people consider if you're not you know if you're not in the top five, you're not really all that good. And that just doesn't, I mean, it's just the product is dog shit for a reason. God damn. What is it? Oh, oh, this, my brain is just starting to tell me that this whole live thing might just eventually 
fizzle the fuck out. <laughs> you think? I, I think they have their product. I just think that they haven't been able to get the type of traction that they really wanted with it. Um, some will disagree and say, oh, no, Live is the best thing since sliced bread. And there's a whole fan base and everything. It is not near what it needs to be in order to be profitable. It's, like it's great. Yeah. And I do like the Live Tour, but like everything in my head's pointing at where this is not sustainable and this is going to be one of those things that we talk about 20 years from now. Remember when they almost did that? Hmm. I'm the not, only difference is, uh, is you've got you've got a trillion dollar fund behind behind them. that. That is the biggest uh, variable to all of this is that there is a fund, and it depends on how stubborn and egotistical they are around the entire thing. That are they willing to just lose money just so that they can say that they have a pro golf product, and that's what it yeah. ultimately is going to come down to, in my opinion, to where like there's enough within the politics of all of this that big time franchise owners are not going to go and buy a live golf franchise. In my opinion, there's too no. much baggage associated with that publicly that could end up hurting your overall business or your brand or so forth. So I just don't see that ended up happening, but I do think live has a viable product right now. We have to remember they're still technically a startup. They're still shifting things in the proper directions and I would just love to see the fact that these guys can play where they want to play. I, I've said that from the very beginning. I think Liv has an interesting, you know, product offering. And I think it fits in a target market that is not what the PGA Tour hits. Um, and that being said, we just need the ability for these guys to still be able to play where they want to play, um, in my opinion. <laughs> Go ahead, Brent. Initial valuation of the team is the fact that we call collectively one billion per four man teams, and the CEO is going to do his board and invest with telling me he wants to invest one billion to leave golf franchise <laughs> staff in the cops and no RI. Think about the public blowback. Hmm. Interesting. I Who think is Ben Hogan, 1953. It's Mr. Hogan. <laughs> yeah. Clearly. From 1953. Um, I you know, I think man I, I have a hard time i have a hard time with this just because um you know for me i was so hard line on it for the first little bit um, so just so hard for it um actually hard hard against it he's yeah, um, really quick <laughs> crickets um oh i'm sorry I was... i'm not gonna be cussing um, <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry about that. Jesus. Yeah, he he was Sorry. saying some really bad swear words for anybody very, that wanted to know. Very naughty words. Um, no, but I think I think what what is difficult um, for me, anyways, is is looking at what's changed um, and what's come out now that this has been the thing for three to four years, I think, and and then looking at the people that run it and realize that they make an interest every day um basically more than what it costs to run the tour um so you know there's just it's just a certain point where you just have to go back to what they're attempting to do and i think greg norman has always kind of had somewhat pure intentions uh even though he's, he's a world-class businessman mm. um can i stop you there because please. there has been a new report around Greg Norman no longer being CEO of Live Golf. Now, we reported this going back about a year and a half ago, I feel like. Mark King was supposed to be stepping in and taking Greg's title. Um, Greg Greg was going, yeah, so, oh. or no, TaylorMade. Mark King was with TaylorMade. Oh, okay. And then he became this uh, Taco Bell CEO, and he actually left okay. the Taco Bell CEO position around that time that we were reporting because we had insider sources that were telling us Mark King is going to be the CEO of live golf. And then apparently we got word that he got cold feet and did not end up moving forward with it. There was just too much baggage with it. He had a good relationship too with Jay Monahan and the tour, which was hopefully going to like mend the fences and so forth. But now that report is back that Liv is actually interviewing and trying to find a CEO 
to take over for Greg Norman? Do we, I mean, so I don't believe uh, Mr. Norman is that well liked across the board. Um, no. <laughs> the general. live guys like him, right? But outside well, of I that. I don't even know. I don't even know if that's necessarily the case. I think that, I think that he, he, he drove a hard bargain for, for all of them and they were all in a position where the money was good enough. Um, and then they just kind of said, Oh, you know, we'll just deal with being kind of the first to do all this stuff. And, but I mean, who knows what's going to happen? I mean, think about what happens in two or three to four, two to three to five years. Like is Dustin Johnson still going to be playing? Is Brooks Kepka going to still be playing? Is, you know, are any of these guys going to still be around? So they need to find somebody that's going to be able to, take the guys that are basically 17 to 25 and be able to take the players that are 17 to 25 in the world, the elite, elite amateurs and elite pros that are there and, and be able to entice them over because otherwise I don't, I don't know how they're going to be able to keep things very fresh. So I assume that's a priority for them, but maybe not. I don't know. It's going to be interesting. Only time will tell around that. And hopefully our inside sources can provide us with a little bit more detail around all of that. Um, Now, the last thing that I will say is that the teams that will not be changing are Martin Keimer's Cliques GC. That team is solidified. Bryson DeChambeau's Crushers. They're solidified. You've got Cam Smith's Ripper GC. They're solidified. And Ian Poulter's Majestics. They are Uh, solidified as well for their team for next year, which opens up the door for a whole lot of other teams than a lot of players within there for those teams, whether or not they're going to be re-signed and whether or not they're going to be playing on that same team. Is that nine? Is that nine players? Nine teams that are restructuring in some way, shape, or form? Yeah. So well, they're just not solidified yet. Okay. So oh, there might okay. be some trades. There might be like, there's still stuff that can go on with all of that. Um, I should have been active listening. I apologize. That's okay. We're going to go ahead and uh, end that here for this week. There's so much to still dive into around live golf. We'll get into it next week as we keep this conversation going. Um, th- that will be the end of it right now. Um, with that said, we do want to give a shout out once again to Swanee's Golf. Folks, go get yourselves a Camden hoodie. This thing is sweet. They've had it for quite some time and really looking forward to uh, all of you utilizing the promo code PullHookGolf25. That's 25% off your entire order at Swanee's.co. Until next time, everybody. <laughs>